All right. Now, keep your finger here. Keep something in Matthew 24. We're going to start off actually in 1 Corinthians 15. We're going to spend the vast majority of the time tonight in Matthew chapter 24. But I want to start off with a point in 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. Now the main topic for tonight, obviously we're, we're kicking off the Prophecy Week, End Times events. It's going to be really exciting. This is the first night. And the main topic I want to focus on tonight is the second coming of Jesus Christ. Of course, that's going to happen in the future. And we're going to look at, at uh, many of the events surrounding this main event of Jesus Christ coming back to earth. Because there's a lot of people, I mean, Christianity knows that Jesus Christ is coming back again. That, that, is, that is extremely basic. We know he's coming back to judge. The first time he came in this earth, he came as the lamb. He came to bring uh, salvation to the world. He came as a servant. He came in humility. But when he comes back again, he's going to come to judge. He's going to come and set up his kingdom. And he's going to come and rule and reign on this earth. And that's widely accepted across Christianity. But one of the things that's not widely accepted is what I'm going to be teaching about tonight as far as when is Jesus coming back and how are we going to know it and, and what's going to happen with us um, prior to his coming back and during his, his, his coming back, we're going to see the events leading up to and surrounding when Jesus actually returns. And um, the first thing that I want to point out about the coming of Christ, we're going to see here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it's the, the resurrection, which is also known as the rapture. Now, you know, a lot of people, some people get upset. They'll say, oh, I can't believe you used the word rapture because it's not a Bible word. And look, I get it. It's not found. You look, you look for the word rapture in the Bible, you're never going to find it. But you know what? The word Trinity also isn't in the Bible. But just because a word doesn't exist in the Bible doesn't make the meaning of the word any less true. So when we talk about the rapture, it's the, it's the catching up in the air when Jesus comes back. So if you have a problem with me using that word, I'm sorry if it offends you. But I'm going to keep using it just so you know what I'm talking about when we, uh, when we use that word. But that also is the same time uh, the, the same event, that rapture, is, uh, is, is the resurrection. That's when people are going to be resurrected from the dead. Our bodies are going to be resurrected from the dead and we're going to receive new bodies in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Our bodies are going to be changed and transformed. So those that are dead in Christ are going to rise first and then us which are alive and remain are going to be caught up together with them in the clouds, in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord, the Bible says. So this is that same event. This is the rapture event. And I want to start off here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Look at verse number 21. The Bible reads, For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, Afterward, they that are Christ's at his coming, then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. Now, the reason why we're looking at this verse is because it's, it's just to lay the foundation that the Bible talks about three resurrections. Christ the first fruits. That's already happened. Christ rose again from the dead. Praise the Lord. I mean, that's, that's where our salvation lies in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But he's the first fruit. So, you know, the first fruits is just is this one little taste. It's a small sampling of what's to come. And because Christ rose again from the dead, we have hope and we have assurance that we are one day going to be resurrected from the dead. Our bodies are going to come back to life. And that is the resurrection that is afterward they that are Christ's at his coming. This is the same event. Look at, I mean, those words, at his coming. It's going to be important as we start going through this. Because what's the main subject of the sermon tonight? It's the second coming of Jesus Christ. So here we see a reference to the coming of Jesus Christ. Afterward, they that are Christ, so believers in Christ at his coming, are going to be resurrected, and then cometh the end. And then he talks about, you know, the, the totally at the end of the world, after the entire thousand reign of Christ on this earth, it says here, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God. It's talking about Jesus Christ delivering up the kingdom to God. Because when Jesus Christ comes on this earth and sets up his reigning on this earth, it's going to be for a thousand years, and then he's going to give that reign back over to God the Father. 
And then, you know, at that very end, that's the last, the final resurrection of the dead, where, where anyone who's ever lived and died, you know, from the time of his second coming all the way until the end, then that's that, that last resurrection that's going to take place in the final, you know, great white throne judgment and everything else that happens with that, which is outside of the scope of tonight's sermon. But I want to point that out because some people try to reconcile verses in the Bible by saying, well, maybe there's multiple raptures. Maybe there's, you know, certain people going up here, certain people go up there. The Bible talks about three resurrections. One's already happened with Jesus Christ. One is, is at the coming, at his coming. And then the last one is way at the end, way after the thousand years of Christ. So we're only looking for one rapture. Because the last one is, is way, 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 way down the line, at when, you know, way after Jesus Christ comes again. And that's why we're turning here, because I want to point that out. And it's also relevant to the coming of Jesus Christ. Now, let's flip back over, if you would, to Matthew 24, because we're going to spend almost the rest of the time in this chapter tonight. I've got a lot, a lot of material to go through. So that's why, you know, take notes if you need to. There's a lot of content that we're going to go through tonight. But... Um, <clears throat> So these phrases like at his coming, when you're doing your own Bible studying, and hopefully you'll, you'll notice some difference in the way that we're going through the Bible tonight, because we're going to get everything in context. And ultimately what I'm, I'm going to be debunking for you tonight is the, uh, this notion of a pre-tribulation rapture. Just to be upfront about it right from the beginning, you're going to be seeing this. But I want you if, if you, if you have this belief or if you've been taught this belief, to just, let's just go through the Bible tonight. And see what it says and try to do it with, a, with an open mind and an honest heart and just get some learning straight from the Bible, straight from God. Because when I've tried to, to listen to people who, who support that claim that, that Christians are going to be raptured and Christ is going to come back, but it's going to be like a secret type of a rapture. Not every eye is going to see him and that you know there's going to be no troubles or tribulations or anything for believers to go through. When I see people trying to support that, what they like to do is they'll take one verse here and one verse here and one verse here and a lot of their own just, just talking in the middle. We're going to go through, this is going to be a Bible study tonight. We're literally going to be going through Matthew 24 and just going through the verses and let's just see what it says in context. Because look it down at verse number 3. And this is where my title, my sermon comes from. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives talking about Jesus Christ. The disciples came unto him privately saying, tell us when shall these things be and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? They ask him a very straightforward question. I mean, there's no doubting what they're asking him. Say, look, the sign of your coming when you come back again, obviously he was with them right there. They're talking about future events because he says, and of the end of the world. What, what's going to happen? What are the signs? What should we be looking for for you to come back again? And then Jesus plainly answers them. So what we see here, because the rest of Matthew 24 is all Jesus talking. And he's directly answering the question that they want to know. It's all perfectly in context. So if we want to know, hey, what should we be looking for as the signs of Christ's coming? What better place to look than out of the mouth of Jesus Christ himself when he was directly asked that question? I mean, literally, this, you know, what shall be the sign of thy coming? This is what we're going to look at tonight. And look at what he says in verse 4, because Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. The very, very first thing he says Watch out. Don't let anybody trick you. Don't let anyone deceive you. Because honestly, when it comes to future events, it's way easier to trick people. Obviously, things that happened in the past, it's a lot harder to trick people because it's already happened. It's been recorded. It's been documented. Things happen. But for things coming in the future, it's a lot easier to get these slicksters that come out and try to rip verses out of context and try to say, oh yeah, this is going to happen. This is going to happen. And, and, uh, and stray people down the wrong path. But it's clear that Jesus wants his disciples to know the answer. You know, oftentimes people say, oh, Jesus is being kind of cryptic here. And you can look at verses and be like, yeah, that's kind of difficult. It's a dark saying. It's kind of hard to understand. But when he starts off saying, look, make sure no one tricks you about this, he's going to lay it out very plainly and clearly, as we're going to see as we keep reading through this chapter. It is very clear. There's a lot of deception surrounding the second coming of Jesus being taught today. And we need to take heed that we're not deceived. 
And before I get more into the deceptive teachings, let's just start looking through this chapter. Let's, uh, let's jump down to verse number 6. He said, well, let's just read verse 5. We already read verse 4. Verse 5, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. He's referring to false Christs that are going to arrive, right? Verse 6, And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Now, what do we hear today? When there's these wars going on and it's, and it's being pumped up as, oh man, there's, there's a war in Syria, there's a war in Israel, there's a war, you know, there's war over here. It's the end of the world. People have been saying that for all time. They say, look, there's going to be wars. Kingdom shall rise against kingdom, nation against nation. And look, for the past 2,000 years since Jesus spake these words, it's been happening. There's been wars. There's been rumors of wars. But we don't need to look at the wars as just saying this is the end of the world. Now look, I believe there are a lot of things that are happening right now that are starting to culminate and, and, and line up with Scripture. But just the fact that there's wars and these, you know, I mean, when is there not a war in the Middle East? <laughs> That's what I want to know. I'd be worried if there wasn't a war going on. Then I'd be like, wow, this is the end of the world. But there's always wars going on. You know, these things, these things are happening. Jesus said, look, don't, don't let this trouble you that there's war. You know, these things are going to happen. Don't, don't start to get too scared and upset that the end of the world's coming because there's going to be wars, rumors of wars. Verse 7 says, For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. So I do believe, based on this phrase right here, all these are the beginning of sorrows, is that the wars and the famines, it's going to ramp up. It's going to start being like a like the, the precursor, like a woman getting in her pangs and traveling and giving birth, right? All these little things start to happen and they're happening more and more and more. You start to see the, the world getting more chaotic and earthquakes and war, you know, all this stuff's happening. He says, this is just the beginning of sorrows, though. This isn't even starting any tribulation yet. It's just, just getting started, just getting warmed up. Verse number 9. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. And you shall be hated of all nations... For my name's sake. And then shall, they, shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another and many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. Now, um, this doesn't look, it doesn't sound to me like a good time to be living in. And we still haven't even gotten to the second coming of Jesus Christ yet. And it's important to notice that. And also pay attention to the wording because Everything that's being spoken here by Jesus Christ is happening chronologically. So if you notice between verse 8, which was these are the beginnings of sorrows, verse 9, he says, then shall they deliver you up. Which means after the beginning of sorrows, after the wars and the rumors of wars, all these other things, then you're going to be delivered up and afflicted. And who is he talking about here? Christians, amen, that's right. It's people who are believers. He's, I mean, he's literally speaking to his disciples, but it's not referring just to his disciples because they're, they've long passed on, right? This is talking about believers, disciples of Christ today, people who follow Christ, believers in Christ. They are going to be delivered up and afflicted, he says, and they shall kill you. Now, I know that there are places in the world where people get killed for their faith. It happens, and it is happening today, but it's not happening yet in some massive scale that would suggest why he's bringing this up. I mean, there's always been heathen nations and, you know, like Islamic nations today that, that will put to death believers in Jesus Christ just for their faith. Or usually it's for converting to Christianity. It's not even just people who are already Christians. It's usually people who used to be Muslim and have converted. But regardless, I'm not denying the fact that the persecution is out there for these people in the world. But it's not, it still hasn't gotten to this point yet to where Christians, by and large, are being delivered up and afflicted and being put to death and hated of all nations. All nations is going to include the United States. And look, it's getting pretty easy. You know, the United States used to be a very Christian nation where people would, would endorse the name of Jesus Christ. I'm not saying that everybody, you know, that there's been a huge percentage of saved people here, but regardless, it's still a, na a nation that has is, that is claimed the name of Christ and that would you know, hold to biblical teachings and, and that, that 
you know, Jesus Christ, is, it's a good thing to be a Christian. But that's changing very rapidly. Very rapidly to where Christians are being denigrated. And, and see, we're not there yet. But the, what we're seeing here in Matthew 24 is that it's going to come. You'll be hated of all nations for my namesake, for the name of Jesus Christ. And then, verse 10, and then, so this is again, after that, after all this other persecutions happen, and then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. I mean, there's going to be people, families going, turning on families, fathers turning against their children, children turning against their parents. Because of this divisive, you know, being a Christian is going to be very divisive. If it's not for you right now, it will be. If we are alive during this time, this is going to be something that's, you know, people are going to be hating each other, betraying each other. And it says, and many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. It's going to be a very troublous time where a lot of false prophets are going to try to claim that they are getting words from God and they're going to deceive a lot of people. And then verse 12 says, and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Let's, uh, let's keep reading here. Verse number 13, because again, all these things are happening, which some people might claim is, is you know, that's tribulation. And is it? Yes, it is tribulation. But guess what? We haven't gotten to the coming of Jesus Christ yet. And he's going in order of all the things that are going to happen. Let's keep reading. Verse 13. And this is a verse that always gets yanked out of context by people who want to teach a works-based salvation. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. I'm not going to get into that tonight, but it's talking about being saved physically. Your body being spared or being saved from being put to death. If you endure unto the end of this time, that's going, you're going to be saved from that. Verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. So this is talking about, you know, the gospel of Jesus Christ is going to go everywhere. Into all nations, the darkest corners of the world, it is going to go everywhere. And then shall the end come. Verse 15, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Now, this is a very pivotal event that happens when we're looking at end times prophecy. This is, you know, obviously recorded in the book of Daniel and Daniel 9 and Daniel 10. And um, this is something that hopefully I'll be out of time to get back to tonight. I got a lot of material to go through. But this is when things start getting really bad. The abomination of desolation is set up in the temple proclaiming that he's God. And look, this is, this is going to happen. We're only in verse 15. No mention of the coming of Jesus Christ yet. No, no mention of that, of that rapture. It hasn't happened. So he's giving us, as the disciples asked, what are the signs? When the abomination of desolation stands in the holy place, this is a very serious sign. Let's keep reading and see what happens. He says in verse 16, Then... Let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. So he's saying once that abomination of desolation is set up in the temple, it's time to get out of Dodge. You know, we need to flee into the mountain. He's like, don't even go back into your house to get your stuff. You just need to go because it's going to get really bad. You thought things were bad. People have already been being put to death. There's already been these troubles and the persecution coming on Christians. He says, once the abomination of desolation is standing in that temple, he says, there, you need to just get out of there. Because it is going to get, he says, it's going to be great tribulation. He's, so, the world hasn't seen anything like that. It's never been like this before. It's going to be so bad, it's going to be like nothing you've ever seen. Nothing. And yes, exactly. We, there, there have been events in the past, like the Inquisition, like other things that have happened where, where Christians have been persecuted and put to death. This is gonna, this, none of that compares to what's going to happen during the Great Tribulation. And notice this now. 
Everything we've been reading up to this point has been chronological, as I mentioned. And, you know, you might be scratching your head going, wait a minute. Why does it say great tribulation there and we haven't even come to, to Jesus Christ coming back yet? Well, the, 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 the basic reading when we're looking at this is because we are going to go through tribulation. And it will be a great tribulation prior to the coming of Jesus Christ. I mean, I don't see how you could interpret this any other way or understand this passage any other way. I mean, we're going through this. Let's, I mean, we'll keep reading. Look at uh, verse number 23. Then, if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even to the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Again, there's the phrase, the coming of the Son of Man. He's still giving more information about the com is his second coming, his return to this earth. And he says the reason why you don't have to worry about you know, if someone's saying, oh yeah, Christ, is co he's come back. You know, the, the, the Watchtower organization, the Seventh-day Adventists who believe that Jesus Christ has already returned multiple times to this earth, but it's been secret. And they, oh, well, he only showed himself to a few people because like the Seventh-day Adventists, hey, they were, they were prophesying that Jesus Christ was going to come back in the 1800s. And it didn't happen, but in order to try to save face, they say, oh, well, yeah, he did come back, but only so, you know, certain people saw him. And they keep changing the dates. You know, Harold Camping's done the same thing, and the Jehovah's Witnesses have done the same thing. And they say, you know what? He's only showed himself to the people in the Watchtower organization, no one else. Look, that's a, that is a lie, and it's very, very clearly proven from the Bible because he says, as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even to the west... So shall the coming of the Son of Man. He's like, every eye is going to see him. You cannot deny the coming of the Son of Christ. It's not going to be a secret thing. It's not some silent event where no one else sees him. Look, every eye is going to see him. Just as much as you can see lightning trial, you know, a lightning bolt that goes across the entire sky, it's un unmistakable. You can't miss that. When Jesus Christ comes back, there's going to be no missing that. That's why I'm saying, look, so a lot of people are going to be saying, look, Christ is back. And, he, you know, the Antichrist is going to be coming back and saying, I'm the Christ. So if people are saying, hey, I think he's saying no. No, 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 no. You don't need to worry about missing Jesus Christ coming back because you're not going to miss it. You don't have to worry about, oh, man, you know, I was... I was on vacation. I came back. Jesus is here already? Really? No, that's not going to happen. You know, I could be locked in, a, in your office for a week, working real hard, and be like, oh, wow, I missed. No. The events that, that surround Jesus Christ coming back, he's saying, you can't miss this. There will be no question, no doubt. If, if, if you ever hear about Jesus Christ coming back and you're kind of like, did he really come back? That's not him. Because it's clearly saying, look, as, as the lightning comes out, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. You will know that he's come back. Let's, uh, uh, verse number 28, for wheresoever the carcass is, there, shall the e there will eagle eagles be gathered together. Verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heaven shall be sha excuse me, shaken. I mean, look at all these things that happen. The moon not giving her light, the sun being darkened, stars falling from heaven. I mean, this is a very chaotic, very significant event. You can't miss this. The powers of the heaven shall be shaken and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. All of these events are going to happen and then the Son of Man comes back. It says, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Look, and it says, all the tribes of the earth. Not just the saved people, not just the believers, not a seeker after where only the believers are going to see him. All the tribes of the earth are going to see Jesus Christ when he comes back in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. So here we see the angels gathering together the elect. This sounds like the rapture to me. Angels scooping up and reaping the earth. 
And it fits perfectly with Jesus Christ coming in the clouds. Now, you know, again, hopefully you're not too confused right now because we just read where it says after the tribulation of those days and that immediately after the tribulation of those days is referring to all of the events that he just covered. Everything else, the people being put to death, Christians being put to death, the, everything, everything prior to these verses is referred to as a tribulation. Everything. So you say, well, what about the pre-trib rapture though? What about Jesus coming and then the seven years of tribulation? Well, here's where it's really important to, to make sure that you have definitions of words just nailed down. Because one of the, one of the key, th the primary reasons why a lot of people are deceived by a pre-tribulation rapture lies just in the definition of the word tribulation and understanding what that means. And see, it goes without saying in most people's minds because it's been hammered into their heads. There's a seven-year tribulation, seven-year tribulation, seven-year tribulation, seven-year tribulation. The tribulation period is seven years with no thought going behind that. Do you know that you will never find in the Bible seven-year tribulation? Not going to find it. Now, there is a future event where, where events take place during a course of seven years. That's true. But nowhere is that whole entire time span in the Bible referred to as the tribulation. Now, we already saw in Matthew 24 talking about the great tribulation, and that was happening before Jesus Christ even came back. So this notion of these seven years of the tribulation is just false. I mean, and, and I would I would challenge you if you say if you because you might have heard that from you know as a little boy going to church, you might have heard that your whole life. Because many people have, especially if you've been going to Baptist churches, you might have heard this pre-tribulation, pre-tribulation, pre pre-tribulation rapture being taught for your entire life. But we have to take what the Bible says as our final authority and what's true. And I will challenge you to find that seven-year tribulation in the Bible. You won't find it. But here's what we're going to do, because I'm going to help you out with this, of understanding the word tribulation. I'm going to try to hurry through this. I have every single reference to the word tribulation that is found in the New Testament. Okay, now, if the pre-tribulation rapture was true, if it's true that, that saved believers are not going to be going through tribulation, if that's a solid doctrine, you might think that during one of the references to the word tribulation, in the entire New Testament, we might see something hinting at that, right? Of, of believers not going through a tribulation. Well, I'm going to read these off. You don't have to follow them. If you want to write down the references, feel free to do so. I'm going to try to blow through this real quickly. Matthew 13, 21, the first time in the New Testament the word tribulation is used. Yet hath he not root in himself, but doeth for a while. For when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word... By and by, he is offended. This is, this is the, the parable of the sower and the seed, where he's saying, look, there's, there's certain people that they're going to believe, they're going to receive the word, they're going to get saved, but after a little while, they're going to be offended because when tribulation comes to them because of the word of God, they're going to be offended. Okay, so there's a, a use of tribulation talking about for the Bible, for believing the Bible. Matthew 24, 21, of course, we already read this. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world, to this time, no, nor ever shall be. A warning given to the disciples of Jesus Christ about tribulation to come because they believe in Jesus. Verse, uh, Matthew 24, verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days. Again, I'm not going to expound on that any further. Mark 13, verse 24. This is a parallel passage to Matthew 24. Mark 13 is the same exact sermon uh, on the mount here being taught to his, to his disciples. Um, uh, just another account. It says, But in those days, after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. Same context about tribulation referring to more believers. John 16, verse 33. These things have I, spoke, I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Hey, this is taught in many churches that say, hey, look, be faithful, be glad in Christ, because no matter what hard times you're going through, Jesus Christ has overcome the world. This is tribulation being told to believers. Say, hey, look, you're going to have tribulation. 
Acts 14, 22, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. Entering into the kingdom of God. That sounds like the time of the rapture when we enter into the kingdom of God. He says we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. Romans 2, verse 9, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil of the Jew first and also the Gentile. This is the first verse that we've come to that is not explicitly, clearly talking about believers in Jesus Christ so far. Now, it could very easily refer to believers, but this is just saying tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil. Believers can do evil just as much as non-believers. Okay? Romans 5, 3, And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. Talking to believers, saying, hey, we glory in tribulation. Tribulation worketh patience. Romans 8, 35, Who shall separate us from the love of God? Who's us? Believers. Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? Romans 12, 12, Rejoicing in hope. Patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. Again, referring to believers. Being patient in tribulation. 2 Corinthians 1.4 Who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. Again, believers. 2 Corinthians 7, 4. Great is my boldness of speech toward you. Great is my glorying of you. I am filled with comfort. I am exceeding joyful in all our tribulation. 1 Thessalonians 3, 4. For verily when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation even as it came to pass and ye know. He's saying, you know, this shouldn't surprise you. We already warned you that we're going to go through tribulation and it happened. Of course it's going to happen because it happens to believers. When you stand on the word of God, you will face tribulation. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, 6, seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. So here we see people who trouble a believer receiving tribulation from God. Okay, the second reference that is not explicitly just you know, referring to believers in all these verses so far. And we're almost done. Revelation chapter 1, verse 9. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation. Companion in tribulation, John. The Apostle John going through tribulation. Revelation 2, 9. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty. And he's referring to a church here. He's talking to a church. Revelation 2, 9. Revelation 2, 10. Fear none of those things which, shall, which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He's admonishing them, hey, you are going to have tribulation by the devil. He's going to attack you. Again, to the same church in Revelation 2.10. Revelation 2.22. Behold, I will cast her into a bed and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. Now, you can argue whether or not this is talking about believers or not. I'm not even going to argue that point tonight because the point I'm making, I think, is getting very clear. The last mention, Revelation 7.14. And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, these are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Revelation 7.14 is talking about the multitude of people in heaven that have been raptured up, that went through great tribulation. Saints that went through great tribulation. Maybe it's time to rethink the doctrine that Christians will not be going through a tribulation. All throughout the New Testament were admonished and warned and told, hey, look, you are going to suffer tribulation. You're going to go through hard times. You're going to be attacked for what you believe. And just to think that the way thing has been all throughout history, the prophets of God in the Old Testament being put to death, God sending his people and then being you know, ridiculed and mocked and stoned and, and rejected is all of a sudden... We're gonna, it's going to change and we're not going to go through the, any tribulation just at the end times. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't follow with the rest of the Bible. But this is why this doctrine is so important because we need to understand that hard times are coming ahead. 
whether it's in our lifetime or not, we don't know, but we have to just assume that th this will happen in our lifetime. We don't know for sure, but we need to be ready as if it will happen in our lifetime. We need to be ready and solid and strong because when the persecution comes, it's going to come pretty bad. And you need to be founded and grounded in God's word in order to stand firm. You need to be standing solidly on the rock of Jesus Christ and on the rock of his word so that nothing will offend you and you'll be able to, to glorify God by not getting afraid, by not backing down, by being able to stand boldly and preach his word, even in the face of some bad times. See, when you're told that, oh yeah, there's going to be bad times to come, but don't worry, you're not going to go through any of that. You're not going to be ready for it. But we're given warning after warning after warning, and Jesus Christ explicitly told me mean, that wasn't very good news for the disciples to be here and all these things that are going to be happening. You're going to be put to death, they're going to be throwing you in prison, you're going to have all this stuff happening. But that's what's going to happen before the coming of the Son of Man. We need to be ready and we need to watch. That's why he even says in Matthew 24 to watch. Just watch you therefore. And Matthew, uh, uh, Mark 13 says the same thing. Uh, yeah, Mark 13 says the same thing. Watch. We need to watch. Now, invariably, People who have gone through the, this, the whole pre-tribulation indoctrination will object here and they're going to say, well, God's not appointed us to wrath. Right? It's a common argument. And, I, and I've heard this a lot. And I'll say, amen. You're right. God has not appointed us to wrath. But again, understanding and having the definitions of our words is extremely important. We just went through that whole litany of, of tribulation to understand the word tribulation and who it refers to because it's referring to believe it's tribulation is hard times it's persecutions it's afflictions that happens to believers i mean what 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 would you say then about people who have been martyred for christ are you going to say that's god pouring out his wrath on them of course not it's persecution it's tribulation and that's what christians go through We're not appointed to God's wrath, but the tribulation is not synonymous with wrath. And this, and this, this, seriously, this is, this is a big stumbling block for people who fall into this because they say there's a seven-year period, it's the tribulation, and it's the wrath of God, and they just kind of mix it all together and just say, this is it, here you go. And, and there's no discernment on, on what the words actually mean. But let's go to that reference 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We're, we're done with Matthew 24 now. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Just like with everything, we need to get this in context. Context is everything. Because, you, you know, if, if you're not thinking and someone just throws that out, say, well, for God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. See, you're talking about us going through all these hard times and stuff, but God's not appointed us to that. So Jesus Christ must, you know, we must be taken out before all those things happen. The problem is in Matthew 24, none of those events that Jesus Christ was clearly saying, these are going to be the signs of my coming, ever mentioned the word wrath. Not once did it say the word wrath. But it said the word tribulation twice. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 is, is where that verse is quoted. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. But let's get that in context and see what he's talking about. Let's flip back just to chapter 4 at the end of the chapter. Chapter 4, verse 13. Because we want to make sure we're getting everything in context. And, and like I said before, a lot of people who teach the pre-trib rapture, they just jump around, just, just grabbing one verse here, grabbing one verse there, and then trying to, to use their own assertions in order to make them match and line up in the Bible. But let's, let's do, we're doing a Bible study. We're going to read the context of these verses. Verse 13, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. So again, another admonition, you know, Jesus didn't want them to be deceived. He's saying, here, I don't want you to be ignorant. You need to know this. You need to understand this concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus 
will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the, again, the coming of the Lord. Remember, we've seen this. Uh, the, the, the whole point of the sermon is the signs of the coming of, of Jesus Christ. The coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. I don't know anyone who's going to say this is not referring to the rapture. It's being caught up together. That's what the word even means. Rapture, it's a catching up, right? We're being caught up together with the Lord. And we see the same phrase there that we saw in Matthew 24, the coming of the Lord. And now look, if you have any doubts as, as to whether Matthew 24 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 are talking about the same event, well, let's look at some of the other things that were mentioned. Stay right there in 1 Thessalonians 4. I'm going to read for you again from Matthew 24, verse 30 and 31. Because here we see, look down in your Bibles at verse number 16. What does it say? The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. Right? Those three things. A shout, voice of an angel, and a trump. Matthew 24, verse 30 says, And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he shall send his angels. So the voice of the archangel here, he's coming with angels, with a great sound of a trumpet, and with the sound of a trump. Referring to the same exact things are happening here. It's the same event. What's happening in Matthew 24 being described there is the same thing that's being described in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. This is the rapture. You can put these, these, these events, they're the same thing. They're one and the same. They have the same things happening. But let's keep reading here. Now, I read through the end of chapter 4. Let's keep reading into chapter 5 because, you know, when these, these uh, epistles were written, they didn't have the chapter delineations and stuff. It was all just one big letter. I mean, in paragraphs and stuff, but it was still one continuous thing. So the thought doesn't end at chapter 4. He continues on into chapter 5. We just saw in chapter 4, at the end there, he's talking about the rapture. He's talking about being caught up together. Verse number 1 of chapter 5, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. You don't, need to, you don't need for me to write unto you about the times and seasons of these things. Look what it says in verse 2. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Now, this is outside of the scope of the sermon, but I just want to point out here, it's referring to the day of the Lord. So just keep that in mind for future Bible studies in reference to what we just read about the rapture. Okay? Um, and that's another whole other, there, there's so much to cover in this, in this topic. It's way, way, way too much to cover in one sermon. So I'm trying to stay focused here, but I just want to point that out. But let's keep reading here in verse number three. He says, but I mean, in verse number two, again, the pre-tripper is going to take you here all day. He's going to say, see, look, the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. So you're not going to know, who knows? And they'll take this one verse out of context, but let's keep reading. And this is what it's always important to do is to keep reading. See what the whole chapter says. And especially if you don't really like have this stuff really well down in your mind and these references, and you're not as good at just knowing like where all the scripture is in the Bible. Anytime someone brings something to you and you start to quote, you be like, wait, I don't know if that sounds right. Always say, well, let's just look at, let me just read the whole chapter. Let me just read it in context, because almost every single time you do that, you'll automatically spot, oh, yeah, well, what you're saying, what, you're, what your, your conclusion is, is invalid, because in context, it's saying something different. So let's see this in context. So verse 2, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night, for when they shall say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, verse number four, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. He's saying, look, 
That's not going to over... Jesus Christ, yeah, he is going to come as a thief in the night to those that are asleep, to those that aren't watching, to those who are in darkness. Yes, he's going to come as a thief in the night to them. They have no idea that because the people in the last days are going to be mockers. They'll be saying, where is the sign of his coming and of the end of the world? Where, where is all this stuff going to happen? They mock and say, it's been 2,000 years already. Come on, he's not coming back. That's the attitude that the unbeliever is going to have. And they mock the Bible and they mock God's word. So yeah, when he actually comes back, they're going to be like, whoa, wasn't expecting that. But the believer, the people who reads their Bible, who studies what, the, what his word says, it's not going to overtake us as a thief. It's not going to be a shock or a surprise that Jesus Christ is coming back. We're going to see all the signs that Jesus Christ himself told us about. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness that, that they should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. It's a serious thing. We need to be watching for this. We need to be watching for the event. It's something we need to be paying attention to. Not because, oh man, he's just going to come and take us out of here. Like, why would you even really have to watch if he's just going to come and take you out before anything bad happens? What are you watching for? Literally, what are you watching for? You're not going to be seeing any of the signs if you think that all of this stuff is going to happen before, before, you know, after you've already been taken out of the world. There's nothing to watch for. If you believe that we're just going to be raptured out of here before anything bad happens. But no, that's not true because we've already seen it in Matthew 24 here. And he's saying, you know, we need to watch. Um, verse 7, For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by Lord Jesus Christ. That's that verse in context. The tribulation is going to come, but when he does come and take us out, when he does come as a thief in the night, he is removing us from the wrath. The persecution and tribulation, yes, we're going to go through that, but the wrath, no. Because after that happens, after Jesus Christ comes back, he's going to be the one pouring out the wrath. That's when you start to see in the book of Revelation, you know, all, the, all the scary stuff in the book of Revelation. The, the water's being turned to blood and all these plagues and, and, and people living in darkness and these, the, the weird you know, uh, insects that have come out that are like locusts and they're stinging people. They have tails like a scorpion tail and, you know, and, they're, and they're, just, they're just, I mean, really biblical plague, wrath of God stuff being poured out. That is the stuff that happens after Jesus Christ comes back. But prior to Jesus Christ coming back is, all, is tribulation. So the stand that I take, we call ourselves, we are post-tribulation believers as far as when the rapture happens because by definition, the word tribulation is just trouble and trials and hardship, which all believers are going to go through anyways. That's what Matthew 24 refers to it as. After the tribulation of those days, that's when we get taken up and then God pours out his wrath. So it's, it's prior to God's wrath being poured out is when we're removed. Now, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We're going to close with this. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. If you want a real quick place to turn to, we went through a lot of detail in Matthew 24. But if you're talking to someone who's, who's been deceived by the pre-tribulation rapture, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 is my favorite place to go. I was actually just out a few days ago and, and was trying to promote the Prophecy Week. And I was saying, hey man, you know, come to this event. You're going to learn a lot. You're going to love it. Because he was interested. He was saved and he was interested in end time stuff. And he didn't really have a, a real hard uh, doctrine on what he believed. He didn't, he, didn't, he didn't come out with it. I was asking, you know, he's like, yeah. And he seemed pretty open. So I was like, hey, check this out. Because he's saying, you know, some people are saying we're going to be, you know, raptured out. But uh, see, with a lot of people that I know, the pre-tribulation rapture never really is settled too well in their hearts because it's just so confusing. Because you read the Bible, but you're taught something different. And you're just thinking like, well, how did... Uh, and then you just start to think, well, I can't understand prophecy because I don't see how this all lines up. Well, it's not that you can't understand prophecy or you can't understand the Bible, it's that you do understand the Bible and you've been taught something wrong and, and that's what's screwing up how you interpret and how you understand the Bible. And so many people just think, man, I can't even understand this stuff. It just seems so far out there. 
when it's actually really simple and if we would just lose the man-made doctrines and let the Bible teach us what it says, then we would be much better off. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, though, again, very, very clear about the signs. What are the signs of thy coming? And, and, you know, and of the end of the world. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, look at verse number 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, there's that phrase again, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're looking at all these places that talk about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And by our gathering together unto him, right? The coming of Jesus Christ and the rapture, us going to him. Verse 2, that ye, should, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. At hand means like it's going ha to happen just at any moment. It's right now. It's going to happen. It can happen today. It can happen tonight. He said, don't be troubled. Don't let people trouble you with that. Don't let them make you think that, that this is going to happen, that this is just at hand. And he says, not even by letter as from us, as if, some, you know, as if it looks like it's coming from us. He's saying, I don't want that to trouble you. Even if, it, if they claim to be the Apostle Paul writing unto you saying, hey, look, the day of Christ is at hand. Don't, let, don't, don't be shaken in mind. Verse number three, let no man deceive you. It's exactly what Jesus Christ said. Look, I don't want you to be deceived by this because many people are deceiving about this. And you talk about admonitions about not being deceived in the Bible, you find it more about the end time stuff than about anything else. I don't want you to be deceived by it. Look, don't be deceived. He's hammering it home. Don't let no man deceive you by any means for that day. What day? The coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That day shall not come except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Now, people might look at this and be like, oh yeah, the falling away, it's, it's, it's happened now, it's happening now. Okay, sure. But don't forget the next part, and that man of sin be revealed. This is the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet that we saw in Matthew 24. Do you see how it lines up perfectly? I mean, there, there is no contradiction in these scriptures. It all matches 100%. The man of sin, the son of perdition, has to be exposed. First, we have to know that this is him. It says in verse 4, Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. We don't need to be troubled as that Jesus Christ could come back at any moment because what has to happen first is the man of sin has to be revealed and when you see somebody sitting in the temple of God and he's proclaiming himself to be God or to be the second coming of Christ, now we know we're ready for Jesus Christ to come back because these things have to happen first. Everything we read in Matthew 24 prior to after the tribulation of those days, all of that stuff has to happen first. And here we see in 2 Thessalonians 2, I mean, this is so clear. I don't see how you could even twist this to mean anything other than what it very clearly says. All of these things have to happen first. And he's referring directly to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together unto him. I mean, how much clearer can you be? But this is, see... If we really want to understand end times prophecy, it's not that difficult, but it takes a little bit of work, it takes a little bit of effort because you have to actually read the Bible. You have to go through these verses. Don't let someone spoon feed you a verse here and a verse there. Go through everything. Go through all the chapters that talk about this and, and really study, study the whole book of Revelation. I mean, the Revelation is talking about end times events. It's, it's, it's revealed from Jesus Christ unto us. He wants us to know. He doesn't want it to be, you know, God's not the author of confusion. He's not deceptive. He's not trying to make things real difficult for us so that we can't understand what's going to happen. On the contrary, he's saying, look, I don't want you to be deceived. I don't want you to be tricked. Let's try to make this as clear as possible. Hey, there's an entire book of the Bible. It's called the Revelation. I'm revealing all this information unto you so you could understand it. It shouldn't be that difficult to understand any more than any other scriptures of the Bible. And when we start looking at them side by side and we take note of the wording and the events, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the coming of Christ, the coming of Christ, and we put all those together and say, hey, look, 
The same things are happening here. It's referring to the same exact event. That's why I started off showing you that there's one coming of Jesus Christ until the very end, then, where the, the final resurrection. There's not multiple, so like all of these references, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Matthew 20, these aren't different comings of Christ. It's all the same event. It's all one. And it all fits together perfectly in this view. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the clear teachings out of the Bible. God, I pray that you would please just help us to, to open up the eyes of those that have been deceived. Lord, that, that, that have been tricked and have been duped into the, the lie of the pre-tribulation rapture, God. I, I pray that you would please help us to do good. Help us to, to be able to open up their eyes to the Scripture. I pray that you would open up their eyes to the Scripture, Lord, but that you'd use us as your instruments to teach and to show the, the, the clear teachings of your Word. And that you'd humble hearts and soften hearts to, to be able to accept that, yes, they've been taught wrong. Lord, I'm sure everyone in this room has been taught wrong about some things in their life because nobody's perfect and no teacher is perfect, dear God. But I pray that you would please help us to yield to your word as the final authority and not what some teacher has taught us in the past necessarily, even a, even a good teacher, even a, even a very um, <clears throat> sincere teacher, dear Lord can be wrong. Help us just to rely on your clear teachings of the Bible and that um, you, you'd bless us and help us to get this message out. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.